I'm pleased uh, to welcome you all here to the launch uh, in Brussels uh, of two remarkable reports on uh, Putin's war in Ukraine. Um, 7,000 uh, people have already died in Ukraine uh, since spring 2014. And more than uh, 2 million uh, people uh, left their homes and have been uh, uh, displaced. Uh, the economy of Ukraine continues to be in a free fall, dragged uh, down by the conflict uh, in the East, and uh, the political order uh, that uh, must uh, guarantee peace and stability in Europe, and also a peaceful uh, settlement of disputes uh, between and within nations uh, is uh, on our continent in question and under pressure. So, we all know this picture, but uh, President Putin denies any involvement uh, of Russia and of the Russian military forces uh, in the fighting uh, about the civil war in, in Ukraine. Um, evidence proving the presence of Russian soldiers and military equipment on the territory of uh, Ukraine uh, is uh, constantly rebuffed uh, by uh, the Kremlin propaganda machinery, claiming that these were troops which got lost during training, uh, and later on that they were even thousands of volunteers who were spending their vacations uh, and their holidays uh, in uh, Ukraine. And, and worst of all, uh, mothers and wives are lied uh, about their sons and about their husbands, and uh, when they return home in coffins, the regime tries to silence their families and to hide the casualties by even, as I've learned, reviving the Facebook accounts of those uh, who were killed. So millions of people in Russia and indeed in Europe and around the world consume and give credit uh, to uh, Putin's screenplay, <coughs> many of them because of lack of access to independent information uh, in their language, but many others because it is more comfortable, I think, uh, it better fits their political purposes. However, I think no propaganda can mislead and accommodate families of dead soldiers, and I'm convinced that it cannot, uh, in the long term, uh, win over open media, uh, silence a free society, and, and kill also the democratic aspiration of the Russian uh, people. And I think that this is the most powerful point about the two reports we have on the table today, and, and I found it absolutely necessary that after uh, it was already presented uh, in uh, Russia. Also, a presentation inside European Union uh, should be done. Uh, both reports operate exclusively with open source information, uh, with uh, evidence collected in communication with people concerned, with also material gathered in detailed so uh, search through the internet and on the ground. So, um, the first report. Uh, which will be presented by Ilya Yashin, is one of the closest collaborators of Boris Nemtsov. It was Boris who started uh, this work uh, earlier uh, this year. And I have to tell you, I admire the courage, uh, your courage, Ilya, and uh, the courage of your colleagues uh, by completing the work uh, after uh, Boris' murder and, and by bringing also this report to the public in, in spite of all intimidations. So the... Um, the authors of this report are a strong reason for hope, I think, uh, in uh, the Russian civil society and its ability also to stand up uh, to the truth uh, and also hold Putin's regime accountable. And the second report uh, has been prepared by the Atlantic Council, uh, was also put together using all possi uh, possible resources of the free internet and the media and completed after a trip also to the conflict uh, zone in eastern Ukraine, and it is based uh, on meticulous search, social media, forensics, geolocation, and also a rigorous uh, analysis. So both reports are different uh, in method and, and also different in resources, but however come to the same conclusion, and that is that the war in Ukraine is a Kremlin-fabricated military conflict 
designated to serve the interest solely of Vladimir Putin, and in other words, the thousands of, of, of killed and millions of displaced are in fact casualties uh, of a covert war against uh, a neighbor, a peaceful neighbor, triggered for the purposes of power uh, preservation. So I'm very grateful to the co-authors of both reports that they accepted our invitation to come uh, to Brussels uh, today. Uh, we in this town, and I think also in all the other capitals of the EU member states, should study uh, these reports carefully, uh, make them public, uh, spread them wider than it is already done uh, today, and also draw the right conclusions for our policies uh, towards uh, Russia. And that gives me the opportunity uh, immediately to, to hand over uh, to Petras Stravicius, the vice president of the Aldi Group, the, uh, who's going to walk us, I think, first of all, through the event. Thank you, Guy, indeed. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, it is my great pleasure to have this opportunity to present Alde sponsored seminar and discussion on uh, war in Ukraine, Putin.war. Uh, and indeed, uh, we have uh, an interesting uh, timing now. Uh, as you know, last week, the European Parliament adopted the report on Russia, which is clearly stated uh, things uh, just mentioned by Guy Verhofstadt as well as uh, in the end of June, we will have the European Council dealing with the issues of uh, uh, sanctions taken by the EU against Russia because of the war in, in Ukraine. And indeed, we have uh, excellent experts, uh, not to speak about um, politicians, here in uh, this podium. And indeed, we have two reports uh, which will be well explained and disclosed to your attention uh, later uh, today. So we have two reports uh, made by two groups. One is led by Ilya Yashin uh, under the title of Putin.war, and another one uh, which is sponsored by Atlantic Council and is uh, made by in the lead of team of uh, Maximilian uh, Czapersky as well as Elliot Higgins. Um, before we go on the reports, uh, I wish to give uh, a floor to Mikhail Kasyanov, who is a Russian statement, statement, as well as the former Prime Minister, who served under the President Putin from May 2000 uh, to February 2004. And I ask uh, Mikhail to present today's view, what, what is going on in Russia, what uh, are the feelings uh, on the streets of Moscow and uh, country around, as well as to introduce to the present politi uh, uh, politics of uh, Russian Federation. And thank you indeed for coming uh, and finding uh, a time to join us uh, for this discussion. Mikhail. Thank you, Petros. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I will be speaking Russian this time. We are Russians today, just not only me. That's why just I would ask you to take your, your, your iPhone points. All right. Уважаемые коллеги, друзья, мне доставляет сегодня честь здесь быть вместе с моим коллегой Ильей Яшиным, чтобы представить ситуацию в России и тот доклад, который сделала группа под руководством Ильи Яшина. Этот доклад, который задумывался нашим близким соратником Борисом Немцовым. Борис Немцов э, в начале этого года уже начал готовить доклад. Э, вы, наверное, все знаете, что на протяжении всего года, когда Путин начал агрессию против независимой Украины, наша партия Парнас заняла очень ясную, четкую, принципиальную позицию, что это агрессия российского руководства, российской администрации, российского правительства против независимой страны. Россия вероломно фактически напала на Украину, вероломно, потому что вера, которая была у украинского народа, она зиждилась на том важном протоколе меморандуме, так называемом Будапештский меморандум, который был подписан Россией, Соединенными Штатами и Великобританией, который гарантировал Украине ее независимость и территориальную целостность. Эта вера была взломана Путиным в прошлом году. Наша партия Парнас заняла принципиальную позицию сразу, и мы организовывали в прошлом году два раза марши в Москве. Борис Немцов 
был главным организатором тех маршей в апреле прошлого года и в сентябре. Более 50 тысяч москвичей вышли вместе с нами протестовать против этой агрессии. В начале года этого года Борис принял решение о написании доклада, составлении доклада. И, как всегда, целью этого доклада должна была быть разъяснение гражданам о том, что происходит, о том вранье и лжи, которые нынешняя российская пропаганда вдалбливает в умы российских граждан, и в частности в отношении и аннексии Крыма, и, в, и э, военных действий на Донбассе, той лжи, что якобы российские военнослужащие не участвуют в боевых действиях, о том, что якобы российская боевая техника не участвует в боевых действиях там, о том, что якобы российские деньги не участвуют там. Все это ложь, и этот доклад разбивает эту ложь, говорит правду. Почему такое негативное отношение к нам, ко всем в России? Потому что мы говорим правду. И Борис, который был дерзко, демонстративно убит у стен Кремля 27 февраля, был рупор. Near Kremlin, uh... Uh, earlier this year, he was uh, um, he he wanted to show this truth to his citizens. Ilya Yashin and his colleagues uh, decided to continue uh, the beginnings of uh, uh, Boris Nemtsov, uh, and they continue to prepare this report. It is presented uh, today in front of you. We already presented it in Russia. We are trying to publish it in regions with uh, using our activists and we hope that here in the European Parliament you will evaluate uh, accordingly this uh, report and uh, uh, and uh, Alde, uh, uh, Alde is, uh, is an initiator of such kind of uh, 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 principal decisions uh, principal assessments of what is going on in Russia, and it is good that Alde is presenting it here today. And last resolution, of course, is, a, is a, uh, assessing uh, uh, very, uh, very clearly what's going on with, in Russia today. Of course, sanctions, which EU sanctions, uh, they will continue. Uh, yes, new sanctions are prepared. Unfortunately, uh, they are inevitable. Uh, if uh, Putin and his uh, so-called team uh, continue to uh, continue this aggression and uh, uh, unfortunately my country today has a lot of problems and these problems are linked to authorities, to power. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, people uh, accept this, uh, uh, it's not very true because First of all, there's a lot of propaganda in Russia. More than 50% of, uh, uh, of Russians, uh, according to Levada Center, uh, receive information only from two sources, two uh, TV channels. And this is why propaganda uh, influences at least a half of Russian population when we say that uh, rights, human rights of uh, Russian-speaking uh, speakers in Ukraine uh, are not respected, when uh, there are Nazis that are trying to uh, make uh, to uh, enslave Russians, and which is which is not true, of course. But now situation changes, and if we continue to help Ukraine, independent Ukraine, and we help uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, nation to uh, get rid of these problems uh, and uh, to continue their EU integration path. It will be uh, a victory, a uh, win for all of us, for all of Democrats in Europe. And uh, then all the Russians, not only those who, um, who work with us, with the uh, pardon us, but uh, the Russians will understand and we can live in respect uh, in respect and uh, in, in, in freedom, and uh, authorities can respect us. So this is why the war uh, in Ukraine is also a question of uh, the future of Russian Federation, of uh, not only of the Ukraine, but also of the Russian Federation. What country we will live in? What will be the architecture of the European security? No one has a right to destruct this structure which exists of the EU security. These people, we have to stop them. This is our common home. And this aggression is unacceptable, it's not acceptable. And that's why these reports, they say the truth and they, uh, thank you.
your introductory words. And indeed, now we move uh, directly to the two reports. Firstly, I wish I mean, to introduce uh, Ilya Yashin on my left. Ilya Yashin is a Russian activist and liberal politician, one of the key leaders of political party RPR Parnas, co-founder and one of the leaders of political movement Solidarnost. He is also a leader of the Moscow branch of the RPR Parnas, in which the Solidarnost uh, participates. In 2005, he was one of the founders of civic uh, youth movement uh, Oborona. And he is an active participant in uh, dissenters, marchers, uh, marshes, and rallies for fair elections. In tw uh, 2012, he was elected to the Russian Opposition Coordination Council. Ilya, floor is yours, and you have some uh, up to 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, dear friends. I would like to thank the European Parliament and the ALDE uh, for the attention that you give us and to our problems that we have. I'm uh, convinced that the Russian Federation will be back to uh, the path of uh, civilized development. Uh, and uh, at one point, we will be able to tell that our country is a part of the European community. But uh, of course, we have to. Uh, the, 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 the path is long to this, and the first step on this path is truth. Is the truth, and uh, uh, and I'm going to talk about the truth and the report that I present today with a lot of honor. It's uh, putting that war. Uh, 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 our friend uh, Boris Nemtsov started to work uh, on this uh, on this uh, report. He uh, was a co. President of our co-chairman of our party, who was uh, uh, killed, savagely killed uh, in the center of Moscow, uh, 100 meters from Kremlin. Boris Nemtsov was a big Russian patriot, uh, but also he loved Ukraine. He loved uh, this culture, this nation, this language, and uh, he had a lot of friends in Kiev, in uh, other Ukrainian cities. And it was a personal uh, tragedy for him. Uh, this, uh, this, 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 this blood war, bloody war, which started uh, uh, in Ukraine. And he uh, s tried to stop the war. He tried to stop Vladimir Putin. And uh, he, th the most uh, important step that he took, and uh, he, what he was thinking about, it was. Uh, uh, informing Russian nation, Russian people uh, about what is going on in uh, Russian-Ukrainian relationships. Russian opposition uh, doesn't have access to Russian television, to national newspapers. So the only thing we have to do, we have to uh, go, uh, go see people and to talk to them uh, face to face. So what he wanted to do, he wanted to make one report uh, which will explain what Putin lies about uh, the fact that there are no Russian troops in Ukraine. And he wanted to distribute it and to publish it uh, uh, largely uh, uh, and to give it to people who receive the information only from propaganda sources. He was killed, Boris Nemtsov was killed, but we finished his work, work he started. I have to say that the most uh, easy part for us, the most easy chapter, was the chapter concerning uh, Crimea operation. Uh, because uh, Putin, uh, he denied his lies himself, and uh, uh, we see that uh, he gives evidence himself about the annexation of Crimea. And we have to, uh, of course, to, to see how he changed his rhetoric, his, uh, his, uh, what he was saying, from the beginning of the operation and today, till today. And we remind, recall our citizens that at the beginning of, the, of this crisis, uh, Putin called all this uh, military, all these people who were blocking uh, uh, these infrastructures in Ukraine, he called them as a local self-defense forces, uh, which have nothing to do with Russian army. 
and when the, uh, where they are put in uh, why actually the uniform looks so much like uh, uh, uniform of a Russian military they said well you can buy uh, this uniform in a store and, uh, and a year after he gave evidence himself on Russian television Russian president said directly he said they were Russian uh, special forces Russian military and he was uh, actually uh, directing their all their moves he was uh, in charge of all their moves and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, of course uh, documents uh, uh, and all treaties uh, which were not respected and uh, of course first was Budapest memorandum uh, not only Russian Federation uh, 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 respected uh, the the sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity, but also he was he guaranteed Russian Federation guaranteed uh, the borders of Ukraine, and Russian uh, paid uh, a big price for this. Uh, well, uh, Russian Federation, uh, uh, so sorry, Ukraine paid a, a huge price for this because uh, they didn't have any uh, nuclear arms, nuclear arms, and. Uh, of course, the logic was uh, very evident. Uh, why have nuclear arms if we have this neighbor, a good neighbor, a, a good ally, who can help you out if there are some problems? And Putin will be remembered as a, a Russian leader who struck a cowardly his uh, ally Ukraine because the Ukrainian people is very close to Russian people and Putin uh, renounced in Budapest memorandum uh, has uh, a cowardly strike in Ukraine he is the leader of Russia who made uh, uh, who set a uh, war between those two peoples he repeated more than once that there are no Russian troops uh, on the territory of Ukraine. In our report, uh, you have uh, words uh, expressed uh, by uh, Russian uh, military personnel themselves. Uh, there are a lot of Russian soldiers and officers who were detained by Ukrainian army. There, were, there are a lot of Ukra Russian military personnel who were arrested, who were wounded, and, and who were unfortunately killed on the territory of Ukraine. I'll just give one example. Uh, Russian paratrooper Nikolai Kozlov. In March 2014, this young man, while serving in the Russian army, he uh, took uh, a Ukrainian police uniform and uh, he uh, took part in the Crimean operation. And when uh, uh, Crimea was annexed to the Russian Federation, Nikolai uh, went back to Ulyanovsk, his home city. He got a military decoration. Uh, here, here he is with this uh, uh, award. He married, and in August 2014, he was sent uh, on Ukrainian territory one more time to take part in military military actions. Uh, he is a paratrooper, and his military detachment uh, has the, to suppress uh, uh, Ukrainian artillery forces, and uh, he was wounded in the action. He lost his leg and he was treated in Donetsk military hospital and then he was transported uh, to the Russian territory. And this information, uh, we got it from his uncle because his uncle thinks that this war uh, is, uh, a, is a crime. He believes that uh, his nephew lost his leg uh, uh, for nothing, for uh, interests of Kremlin. And that's why he decided to make this information public. Of course, this is an exception, but there are a few cases like that. Another, another, another example, a Russian soldier, Petr, Petr Koklov, he, tell, uh, he tells that uh, in uh, his military detachment they had to mask their uniform, mask uh, uh, Russian military equipment to send it to, to Ukraine and uh, to give it to separatist forces. And uh, Koklov says that he took, took part himself in those operations. 
In the last 18 months, uh, uh, separatist forces in Ukraine lie that their military equipment uh, was uh, uh, just caught from the Euro Ukrainian army, that they uh, caught this military equipment that repaired it and they use it now. Uh, but it is a lie and it is very difficult uh, to uh, prove prove the truth because uh, very often Ukrainian and Russian military equipment uh, are actually the same and they were produced in the uh, in the time of the Soviet Union so it is very difficult to prove uh, that uh, this uh, military uh, equipment belongs to uh, Russia and not to Ukraine but uh, there are some facts which uh, um, allow us to say that uh, Russian military equipment is sometimes uh, uh, transferred to Ukraine. In Minsk agreement uh, there is a mention of Tornado S, uh, an artillery system. It's uh, Russian uh, artillery equipment and it has never been exported. Tornado S uh, uh, belongs only to Russian army. It's the only army in the world which owns it. And in Minsk agreement there is a mention of the fact that uh, separatist forces uh, engage themselves to uh, withdraw their military equipment, including a Tornado S system. And this document is signed by uh, Russian officials. So Minsk agreement confirms that uh, uh, separatist forces uh, own the system. Uh, it means that Russian officials and Putin himself confirms that this military equipment was given to Ukrainian separatist forces. There are no other way to uh, get use of this equipment. One more example a Panzer S-1. Uh, separatist forces have consistently denied that they often those rockets. It's uh, Russian uh, military equipment, a rocket uh, launcher, which was exported to several countries, but the only country uh, which uh, owns this uh, rocket launcher uh, it's just an Ukrainian neighbor, it's my country. And separatist forces have consistently denied that they own this rocket launcher, but we found evidence that it is used in military operations in Ukraine. We managed to, to get a, a video from a, a vehicle registrator, personal vehicle registrator in Lugansk. Uh, it was a private car. Uh, this, uh, uh, this video equip equipment was installed in a private car and uh, it uh, um, was able to capture this uh, rocket launcher in Ukraine. And here you see a clear picture of this rocket launcher just uh, under the billboard with the pictures of uh, so-called Donetsk and Lugansk people republics. You have uh, Platnitsky's picture and uh, here Zakarchenko's picture. So there are no doubts. Uh, it's Obronne Street in Lugansk. Uh, it's evident that uh, this is Panzer S1 Russian rocket launcher. It's one more evidence. Well, I won't uh, give uh, more details. Uh, we have a detailed analysis of the tragedy with the Malaysian Boeing. Uh, it's evident that it was uh, uh, shut down by uh, uh, separatist forces and we managed to locate the spot uh, uh, where the equipment uh, used uh, to uh, shoot down this plane was located and uh, this report was prepared by us. Why? Because we are uh, Russian patriots. 
and we do everything to protect uh, our national interests. We believe that this war, which was never declared, is a crime and it's a cynical uh, crime against uh, Ukrainian people and this war goes against uh, Russian national interests. That's why we do everything to stop this war. That's why we try to speak loudly about uh, the criminal nature of this war. That's why we try to attract international attention to this crime and uh, the attention of the Russian uh, people themselves. We believe that this war has to be stopped. We believe that this war uh, goes against uh, Russian interests and uh, does a lot of prejudice to Ukraine and to Europe. And we see the possibility to do it. But in order to do it, we need very tough and consequent uh, actions. You can't uh, play with the aggressor because uh, uh, as a result, uh, the conflict uh, will escalate. Uh, in my opinion, uh, those uh, uh, tentatives to build dialogue with Putin only confirm what I have just said. We'll do everything to persuade Russian society that this war is a crime, but we want the European politics to be tough. And we want... Uh, uh, them to believe that Europe uh, has not only its in, uh, interests but also its values, values which have always underpinned the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya, very much for your clear message, uh, message which is, uh, should be understood and, and heard in this House uh, as well. Before I move uh, to the next presentation, I want to inform you that we will have some 30 minutes for Q&A session. So prepare your questions and um, um, kind of comments. And now I'm happy to introduce uh, the second uh, report we are going to, to hear uh, today, made by two prominent uh, experts, by Maximilian Czapersky as well as Elliot Higgins. I mean, the report uh, is supported by the Atlantic Council, and uh, this is my very pleasure to introduce these two brilliant uh, young uh, men and ask them to, uh, to have some 20 minutes for their presentation. The floor is yours, gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so very much for having us here today. Uh, I want to get right into the weeds and to set the scene about our report. I want to actually turn to Mr. Putin himself. Give him one second here. Uh. Finally, you asked whether our troops are present in Ukraine. I can tell you very clearly there are no Russian troops in Ukraine. I can tell you very clearly there are no Russian troops in Ukraine. This is Vladimir Putin this spring lying to his own people. And in response to allegations of Russian involvement in Ukraine, Ukraine Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said in January of this year, if you allege so, if alleged, if you alleged it so confidently, present the facts, but nobody can present the facts or doesn't want to. So before demanding from us that we stop doing something, please present proof that we have done it. Now at each time when the United States or its European allies and NATO try to present those facts by showing satellite images, by showing other sh sort of evidence, Sergei Lavrov and the Kremlin were very quick to respond claiming, oh, these are just video games. So. They did so as part of a broader propaganda campaign in an attempt to create confusion among Europe and its allies, to make sure that there's enough blurriness, that there is no clear strategy and response by the European Union and its partners to the aggression of Russia and Ukraine. So by creating this report, we actually want to bring clarity to the discussion about Russia's aggression in Ukraine. Because in our view, the evidence as also partially pointed out by Leah, is literally hiding in plain sight. So what we did over the past few months is that we looked at soldiers' engagements on the ground, ranging from regular Russian soldiers being there, um, who are then ready for combat at improvised camps along the Russian-Ukrainian border, who are backed by steady flow of arms and equipment, and who at times even receive cross-border artillery, sharing uh, support 
to change the equilibrium in Daya favor. And we've been able to do all of this because people share, and people share information about their vacation, about their private life, food, but they also share information about things they find curious. So for example, a convoy is going through Daya town. That's interesting, let's post it on Facebook, Twitter, Vcontakte, Instagram, YouTube. And the amount of information that people put out there is so overwhelming that you receive data points. So we merge that information that we can create data points that allow us to create a very firm, very firm picture of what is going on on the ground. And to do so, we use, um, uh, we use the geotags that are nowadays available in most pictures posted online and verify it with a methodology called geolocation so that we know that the information that we find is actually real evidence. Elliot? So this is a, this is a very simple example of how geolocation works. This is a video from July 17th showing a uh, book missile launcher being transported through separatist-held territory. And this video, uh, when it was posted online, came with some additional information. It was tweeted uh, along with coordinates and a time. Now, when we see this information, we just don't take it at face value. We want to have a look at this. So we put the coordinates into Google Earth, look at satellite map imagery that's available to anyone. And this shows us these apartment buildings. It looks very similar already. But we start looking at the fine details that are available. So for example, we can start matching items that are visible in the satellite map imagery to what's visible in the video itself. We can also look at things like the uh, paths that are laid out in the video. And by looking at multiple points like this, this is, allows us to build up a picture and confirm where these videos are filmed. But it's not just about filming, finding the position of vehicles. We can also do it to find where soldiers have been inside Ukraine and Russia. So we used, and in the example that Ellie mentioned, you know, we highlighted a few points, but there's thousands of examples in them that we used to actually make sure that the picture is true. And we used in that methodology to also track soldiers, and one of them is Bato Dambayev, one of hundreds of soldiers that we tracked, who is a member of the 37th Motorized Infantry Brigade, and we were able to look at the pictures that he posts and trace them all the way back to his home region of Buryate along the Russian-Mongolian border. From there, he embarked on a journey more than 4,000 miles, 6, 000, more than 6,500 kilometers, to the Russian-Ukrainian border to a, uh, to a camp near Kuzminska. Um, this is the camp, and you can visibly see it on, on Google Maps. Um, and if you actually have access to internet, you can go on Google Earth and Google Maps to this very location or one of dozens of other locations along the Russian-Ukrainian border, and you can see how this is part of a bigger strategy, preparing its soldiers for combat. Here's Kuzminska in October of uh, 2013. Nothing there. A year later, you see how it grew. This is a close-up of the location. If you actually zoom out, you'll realize that this is a camp that features thousands of soldiers. And Bato embarked then from this camp across the border into the Donbass in February. Many of you may remember it as the time when the, uh, the socket of the Baltzabe happened. And he was stationed at this very checkpoint. If we zoom in here a little bit, you can see the checkpoint right there. And this is the picture that he posted. Now, we can again then try to compare it. And I'm only going to highlight a few elements. But you see here the markings, the house in the background, the tree line, and so forth. And then there is just several other elements that we used to verify this, such as press events that happened around there, other pictures by other uh, civilians that were posted. But to actually really make sure that all of the mythology that we use in our report, that it is true, we actually handed all of this information to a journalist, Simon Ostrowski from Rice News, who has gone to the very location. And he was able to prove that every single step that we do in our report is absolutely sound true and that this mythology is applicable and can help us to determine what's going on on the ground in Ukraine. This is part of a larger documentation Vice News is actually publishing today, so I encourage you all to go to vicenews.com and, and see the documentation. You can see the entire story of the report being broadcasted there. Simon traveled then following Bato all the way to Ulan Ulde. He found his family, he found his troops, he found the camps. So everything is actually, if you want to get more information, I encourage you to see that. But many soldiers, did not come back, as Ilya was pointing out. Many of them end up being shipped back as cargo to 100, and it just underscores the really tragic toll 
that the war has taken not only on the Ukrainian people, but also on the Russian public. And one interesting thing, if you use all these methodologies, is if you put them together, you can do something more than just tracking equipment or tracking soldiers. You can actually also track convoys. For example, a book missile system. After flight MH17 was downed on July 17th, it was possible to track the movements of a, the Buck missile launcher through separatist-held territory using the same geolocation investigation techniques used in the Hiding in Plain Sight report. It was also possible to match the markings and damage on the Buck missile launcher to a Buck missile launcher that was seen in Russia between June 23rd to 25th as part of a convoy that we again were able to geolocate using the same investigation techniques, traveling from the town of Kursk in Russia down to Milorovo near the Ukrainian border. In addition to that, we were able to investigate the actual origins of the convoy by searching the social media profiles of soldiers in Kursk, which linked this convoy to the 53rd Brigade. Um, it was then possible to confirm the soldiers' participation in this convoy by further investigation. So, for example, we have a photograph here that was taken by one of the soldiers on the bus as he, they were in the convoy, and you can see one of the soldiers is fast asleep behind him. That same soldier was also visible fast asleep in the convoy videos. So, not only that, we were able to find images like this, where they're taking photographs of their own ro roll call sheets, which had a list of names of the members of the unit, which we then searched for on social media. So we would be able to build up an idea of who was part of the 53rd Brigade, who was in the convoy that tr transported the Buck missile launcher that downed MH17 to the border. And now after several months of research, we've collected details of over 200 soldiers who were part of the unit. And in July, we plan to pace, uh, publish a report showing the other faces of MH17, the members of that convoy who transported the missile launcher to the border that downed MH17. So what do we take from all this? Um, first of all, there will be no conflict in Ukraine, but for Mr. Putin's strategy to provoke one. We don't have a Ukraine problem, we have a Putin problem. Second, the best antidote to misinformation, to counter this hybrid war, is to speak clarity and to speak truth. And third, social media forensics and geolocation analysis are powerful tools that can help us in doing so. Fourth, this report also self serves as a warning and so does Elias. It's a very stark warning to the European community after having battled for so long to create a peaceful Europe that today, once again, we are faced with a conflict on our continent that has to end immediately. So there's been many strong voices supporting this report, and Mr. Geith Hofstadt was one of them. And we encourage policymakers to draw on these insights to inform their policy decisions and to look beyond the fog of propaganda and look at the evidence that's hiding literally in plain sight, to take off the table any chatter curtailing sanctions, but to confirm its extension so the pressure increases and those who continue to fuel this war. And more so, to galvanize our community of, on both sides of the transatlantic alliance for a more comprehensive strategy to end Mr. Putin's aggressions. And it's important to remember that Putin has used this crisis first and foremost to consolidate his own authority at home, wiping up patriotic sentiment to pepper over the, own Kremlin's, the Kremlin's own failures at home. Therefore, unmasking his deception of his own people is a key part of a strategy to end his aggression by hitting back where it's most vulnerable. So we must demo demonstrate solidarity with the Russian people and those as courageous as Ilya, who actually speak truth about Putin's lies. And let me end with the words of those who have endorsed uh, the conclusions of this report, including Mr. Uh, Giver Hofstadt, uh, and I quote, we all share a vision of a Europe whole and free and at peace in which Russia finds its own peaceful place. But Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine threatens this vision and the international order. Thank you. Thank you so much for this excellent report and um, the job you did uh, before making this available. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, some good time for Q&A session. Uh, I ask you to present yourself, uh, to use microphone, because we have some uh, interpretation and to explain your point or comment uh, you want to make. And I see the first one, Sandra Kalniete. 
Yeah. Thank you. I'm Sandra Kalniete. I'm elected from Latvia and I belong to European People's Party. Uh, I'm raised in, in Soviet Union and I remember that my entire life, uh, Gromyko, the, the foreign minister, always presented different peace initiatives to the world. And whenever I'm listening to Lavrov, I have the same feeling that Russia again is that country which was Soviet Union, because what they are trying to present is untruth presented, presented as truth. However, uh, my concern more is about um, the lack of very clear and strong stand uh, by European Union member states on the issues which are substantial for European future. Uh, we are spending 400 billion for Greece, but we are hesitating to spend 40 billion for Ukraine and the question, which is not invented by me, but by, uh, by Timothy Snyder, is um, what is more essential to the future of Europe today, Greece or uh, Ukraine? What would be your answer? Sandra, would you indicate somebody exactly you want to ask this question, or this is a question to the panel? To Lydia Yashin or to Mikhail Kasyanov. Mikhail, you are an economist yourself, I mean, I... Uh, I'm not uh, representing just one or another country of European Union, but uh, uh, definitely for us, uh, for Russians, that's um, uh, very important so that the whole uh, architecture of, uh, of uh, European security will be preserved. In fact, of course, Greece is an important country and should be part of European Union. That's, I'd like to believe, that will be the case. And Ukraine and Ukrainian people who made their choice for European integration, of course, should be supported. Should be supported, and these people, the, the country, should follow this, the, the, this track. The problem, the problem is that today, uh, uh, Ukrainians and uh, those who were elected recently, President Poroshenko and the parliament, and the government should realize that they have, in fact, the last chance. The last chance to reconfirm their future. And uh, for that, they now have a very good opportunity to be consolidated and to pursue reforms. Uh, the fact is, for 25 years of existence of Ukraine, they never had any single reform. They just now, just the half of the country, or part of the country is devastated in totality. But they need, they badly need reforms, institutional reforms, structural reforms, and reforms in every sphere of life. And that we all expecting these unified authorities in Ukraine would start doing this. They doing just step by step, but very slowly. And in fact, the whole international community, I'm sure, will stand by and will support any effort of Ukrainian authorities to, to implement those reforms which Russia badly needs. And I think just the European Union is obliged to stand just by strongly and to be prepared to have a, a heavy support for, for Ukrainian state. As soon as they're implementing the promises they've given to the people and to European society, that they continue to, to, to go this path. I mean European integration. The association agreement signed, uh, uh, already in place, starting with the 1st January uh, to, uh, 2016, the, the economic part will be in place. That's very important to, 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 to follow this and, <clears throat> and to help Ukrainian authorities to implement it in place. As soon as this, uh, I would say, just destroyment of oligarchy structure, uh, which uh, was inherited from the previous uh, periods, would be, would be implemented, I think that will be absolutely clear. Corruption is problem number one. Subsidies is problem number two. The distribution of national wealth, more than 50% of GDP, that's awful, unacceptable in principle. It, uh, only, only, I would say, Sweden and partially maybe Germany can afford just to have like 40, 44% of redistribution, but not such a country like Ukraine or Russia even, although we have some reforms in Russia. We had these reforms in, uh, in the beginning of the century. That's why just I think just for European Union, that's absolutely important to be ready to step in in a heavy support. 
Thank you, Ilya. I will be short. Uh, of course, we know all the problems uh, between EU and uh, Greece. We know about uh, the Greek prob economy problems. Uh, but I believe the main goal for European Union today is to save Ukraine. It's not just about Ukraine. It's about Russia. It's about Russian democratic movement. It's about European countries. It's about Europeans' future. Because uh, if Ukraine fail, it will be the great damage, not only for Ukraine, but for Russian democratic movements, for Europe, and for European future. That's why I believe uh, all we should come together and support Ukraine. It is very important for all of us. And uh, if Putin will fail Ukraine, if Put it will be the great victory for Putin as a dictator. It will be the great victory for Putin's regime, anti-democratic regime. And Putin will understand after that he can do everything he wants. He can send his troopers everywhere he wants. He can take the territory he wants. And that's why I believe we should support Ukraine and European Union should support Ukraine just to stop Mr. Putin. And that's why I believe it's one of the biggest goals. Thank you, Ilya, for your very clear message. And uh, next on my list, I see um, uh, Minister Fotiga, my colleague from Poland. Thank you, Petras. Uh, Gospodin Kasyanov, Gospodin Yashin, Serdeczny uh, Privet. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kasyanov, Mr. Yashin. I'm, I, I'm a former uh, foreign minister in Poland, of Poland, and I uh, worked with Mr. Kaczynski. And probably easier. Thank you for her. And I would also like to, to thank uh, the Atlantic Council for, for both reports. Uh, first of all, allow me to salute Boris Nemtsov uh, for the work he initiated in reporting. Uh, this issue. Uh, it is extremely uh, important uh, your presence here and presentation of both uh, reports in the Forum of European Parliament. Uh, um, my reflection is about necessity to define exactly the hybrid war launched by, by Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin regime not only against Ukraine, but actually against uh, many of us. In my opinion, we have to, to, to somehow to, to go to, to earlier events and assess them very clearly and very carefully, starting with uh, Russian aggression in, in Georgia, even probably a, a bit earlier. We have to assess propaganda war launch against not only Ukraine, but whole Western system, Western values, Western world. And we have to, 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 to deter this. I agree with you that, uh, um, I would say, naive re-engagement uh, reflections uh, are not the, the necessary steps to deter Putin. And my question is uh, very precise about uh, sophisticated systems mentioned by you, Panzer S1 uh, book system, the third one. Um, do you have uh, evidence of these system being deployed after Minsk one, Minsk two. It is very important because this argumentation is necessary for us. The the actions of the Russian Federation after Minsk two. Thank you. I probably ask Ilya as well as our Atlantic Council colleagues. I mean to respond because the questions are very precise, technically speaking. Uh, so actually, I don't think uh, that Putin had a goal uh, to go deep into Ukraine. Uh, it looks like after Minsk 1 and after Minsk 2, it looks like that Putin uh, would like to use the situation on Donbas as a mechanism of pressure on uh, Kyiv's authority, on European countries. Uh, he would like 
it looks like he would like to freeze these conflicts and use it as a mechanism of pressure. Uh, but it doesn't mean that situation uh, cannot be changed. Today we have this situation, but tomorrow situation may, may, be, may be different. And that's, uh, you know, Putin will uh, have, uh, uh, I'll try to do it in Russian. Uh, Putin will uh, take uh, t take what he what you will allow him to take. Take everything you will allow him to take. In, uh, Russia, EU, and uh, Ukraine relations, and uh, to take control on the board line. That's the main goal. Uh, in the situation when Putin still have control and separatists, pro-Putin separatists still have control on the board line, this critical situation on Donbass will, will, uh, will continue. And the second part, sure. Max, Elliot. Sure, sure. So the, what is evident from uh, our research is that the Kremlin stepped in at each time when the Ukrainian forces seemed to be making strides and gains against against the so-called separatist forces. So each time and each turning point in the conflict, be it in August and July, be it in February recently, or at other turning points, Russia came across the border to make sure that its proxies on the ground still have the balance of power in its favor. And one of those moments obviously was the time when uh, excessive amounts of uh, heavy military equipment, including a book missile system, came across the border. Um, Oh, we go. <laughs> um, I would just like to make a point about the practicality of this. There's, I often get asked, you know, what kind of resources are needed to do this work? Well, um, when we were tracking the vehicles that were from Russia and in Ukraine, uh, we crowdsourced images. We asked people to send the images to us. We then verified them. And my team, you know, I'm, uh, I have a team, of, a small team of volunteers doing this work. You don't need a huge buzz budget. You can do this with virtually no budget, as I found. Um, and you can produce very useful information. We ha now have a public database of around 400 sightings of military vehicles in Ukraine and Russia. And this is all crowdsourced information that was verified independently. Um, so I think when you're discussing this and you're thinking of the practicalities, you need to think this isn't something that is a huge and costly and time-consuming process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I saw a hand of gentleman in, in the second row. Yes, that's you. Please introduce yourself and make your question. Hello, my name is Chris Piak. I'm an ALDE individual member from Düsseldorf. And I have a personal question for you, uh, Mr. Yassin. Um, Putin uh, introduced a, a new rule that um, if you talk about uh, death soldiers in peacetime, you face up to seven years in prison. My question is very simple. Are you concerned for your own safety and your own freedom? You know, it's one, uh, we, we made a lot of presentations and first time it was the uh, most popular question for me. What is the Kremlin reaction on your report? And to be honest, for the first time, I had no answer because it was the only reaction, uh, the words of uh, the Putin's press secretary, Mr. Peskov. Uh, one of the journalists uh, made, made a call to him and he said, I didn't read. Uh, the next day, we sent this report to Mr. Peskov, to Mr. Putin, to the key persons in uh, government, and, you know, looks like they've read. Because this executive uh, order you mentioned, uh, uh, I recognized it as an answer, as a reaction of Kremlin. But, I would like to pay attention to one of the detail. So, okay, Putin says that it's illegal to make uh, in public information about the dead Russian soldiers. But from the other side, he says there are no Russian troops in Ukraine. So, if you make our report illegal, that means you accept the information about Russian troops in and it's okay, okay. If you make it illegal, that means uh, it's well done. Thank you, Jeet. I saw a hand on the second row on my left. Please. Thank you very much. Gadimnas Forwaris, Lithuanian ambassador to Belgium. 
Well, thank you for all the authors of, 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 of these reports for very, I would say, persuasive presentations here today. Uh, of course, for somebody who follows the events very closely in Ukraine and in Russia, uh, it's a little bit like, you know, we have a feeling that you are preaching the, the converted people already because, of course, we, those facts, ironically, I would say, they are, I think, better known in this part of Europe than, than, than probably in, in Russia itself. And therefore, my question is, what is the level of awareness in Russia about, about those facts? And uh, how, how, what would be the means how to better reach out to the Russian society to get this, all, those, all those facts, all these messages across in Russia itself? Of course, the EU, Europe has to play its part, and, and some preparations are ongoing, ongoing on how to, I mean, make media in Russian available that, that, could, be, that could also reach the, the, the eastern part of, of Europe, Russia, Ukraine, and other Russian-speaking countries. But uh, really, I would be very much interested in hearing what do you think, uh, what is the level of awareness in Russia about, about this? Thank you very much. Uh, so we have no, we have another way except to go to the people and speak, tell people to the truth face to face. You know, shake million hands, like in soft did, like we do right now. We would like to print lots of copies of this report. And we will go to Russian cities, to Russian society, and we will try uh, to make this information more public. Actually, we had a lot of presentation, not only in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in uh, uh, Yaroslavl in Nizhny Novgorod, on Ural in Chelyabinsk, for example, in Siberia, in Novosibirsk, for example. And I can tell you that there are a lot of people come to listen, not to fight us, not to say bad words against us, just to listen, to get information. And uh, I can give you one interesting example from Chelyabinsk, for example. Uh, it was about uh, 100 people come to listen, and it was about uh, three or four provocators from Putin's party who came to stop the presentation. And uh, one moment they started to say that uh, it's an anti-Russian report, stop it, and something like this. And in this moment, uh, a man stands up about 45 years, and he said, hey, you shut up. I'm an Afghan veteran. I tell you what that mean when your government send you as a trooper to kill and to die to another country. And you know, uh, it's typical, in Russia, it's typical to think that the people like this veteran are very pro-Putin, but it is not true. And I can I give you an example. Uh, from the other way, it's very important to fight the propaganda, fight against this propaganda. And we try to do it very hard, but I think European countries, United States, can do more for this. And uh, you know, Mikhail Kasyanov, he visited the United States with Vladimir Karamurza, another our colleague. He's in hospital right now, and uh, we think he, uh, could be, could be poisoned. Uh, they visited with an idea of sanctions against propaganda people. It's very important. It is extremely important to make sanctions against these guys who, lying, who are lying daily to Russian society, who are uh, responsible for this atmosphere of hate. Of, of hate. And uh, we believe this sanction can work very good. Thank you. Do you want to? Yeah, I'll add briefly complete. that partially with the mythologies used in this report um, and also some of it in Elias um, and the work that Elliot is doing with <coughs> Bellingcat, uh, we have the opportunity because so much of the media is in the control of the Kremlin. But here we have an opportunity to train Russian journalists, independent journalists, and citizens and citizens in a lot of the neighboring states where we see a lot of the hybrid and propaganda wars starting to pop up, be it in Transnistria, Latvia, um, or Georgia. Um, if we actually train people using some of these mythologies, we almost have ambassadors of fact-checking, uh, so to speak, and it becomes increasingly difficult 
uh, to spread propaganda in, 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 in this region. So what definitely is something that we greatly recommend is, is to promote a policy uh, for the European Union to pursue, uh, you know, support and funding of any of these, of these um, groups that focus on this type of mythology and help them getting trained, because it doesn't take much financial resources, but you can you come up with results that uh, you know remarkably, um, remarkably clear and, and help you speak the truth about what's going on. And floor goes to the gentleman in a third row, just in front of me. Yes. You are, you are recognized. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Chairman. I'm Christian Forstner with the Hans Seidel Foundation. Yeah, it's a, that's a German political foundation, yeah, but with an office in Moscow as well. Thanks a lot for all these facts. Yeah. I'm wondering, yeah, on page six, yeah, you indicate um, uh, the report Putin war yeah, from Boris Nemtsov. Uh, on page six, uh, you indicate uh, the motivation yeah, for the intervention in Ukraine yeah, with the uh, domestic uh, climate and to boost the image of the president. Yeah. So is it the main explanation you want to provide, yeah? so uh, this uh, domestic uh, agenda uh, of the president Putin, yeah? or do you see it in a broader context, yeah, in a foreign policy, yeah? uh, a great power, Russia, yeah, against the West? Yeah? So is it linked to more foreign policy or only with the domestic explanations? Mr. Kasyanov. Uh, yes, the main reason for Mr. Putin's aggression is domestic policy, just the desire to keep power. Mr. Putin and his team recognizes that the, the current position is not quite legitimate because just the elections of Federal Duma, December 2011, were not just elections was just imitation. Elections of the president, March 2012, was not just an election, but imitation. Mr. Putin chosen himself those competitors whom he wanted to compete. And uh, we are happy just to see that not only us, Parnas and some other Democrats in Russia, but also the whole European Parliament adopted the special resolutions recognizing those elections not free and fair and not just in accordance with the international standards. And just when you have no policy of reforms, but Russia continue to need, badly need, re, needs reforms, just when you cannot pursue any reforms because any reform just it's produced some kind of risk. Mr. Putin cannot afford any risks. They cannot undertake any reform. Just when you pursue the policy which simply spending money, just oil, money getting out of sales of oil and gas. In this case, of course, just your, uh, sooner or later, your, your policy would inevitably would bring to the problems. And Russia inevitably supposed to be f and, uh, to, to face with problems. And to, to, to any authoritarian regime in the world, that's always, always a case and scenario to find an external enemy. External enemy and quick victories. External enemy was found, the United States of America, and suddenly it appeared to be the transatlantic union, transatlantic unity. That was a killing point for Mr. Putin. He never believed that the European Union would be so consolidated inside European Union and transatlantic unity would walk this way. After the war in Georgia, when so-called Ceasefire plan with the name of former president of France, Sarkozy, and that time France was the chair of European Union. You remember just within three months, just none of the points were uh, stipulated there, impl were implemented by Russian government, none of them. But three months after, European Union and the United States just came back to Mr. Putin as business as usual. Mr. Putin understood that is the way, and this is a special ticket, the whole civilized world issued for him a permission to behave this way. And that inevitably brought to the situation with Ukraine, with Crimea and Ukraine in particular. That's why just I'd like to emphasize just the main reason is inter internal reasons, keeping power. And today, of course, Russia faces with the problems, economic problems, because for the last 10 years there were no reforms. And of course, that is the main reason of problems, economic problems in Russia today. Uh, of course, other issues like 
just uh, drop of oil prices and uh, uh, sanctions, of course, of course, I would say, uh, brought this, uh, um, uh, is, uh, the problems is uh, closer. I would say uh, cultivated, cultivated these problems today. But uh, the, main, the main problem, there's internal problems in an economic policy too. That's why, that's why the, all, the whole picture is just to impose the mobilization spirit inside Russian community inside Russian society, just uh, with the quasi-patriotic um, uh, uh, efforts, just to consolidate them and just to, 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 keep, to keep some kind of artificial support of current regime. Thank you. Ilya, would you like to add a few words? I would like to add a couple of words. I think that your question is linked to, to uh, big uh, uh, European and uh, American questions concerning should we wait from Putin uh, a recreation of the Soviet empire, aggressive empire, and uh, I think this danger is uh, overestimated, which doesn't make him not dangerous, does make Putin not dangerous, of course, but this danger is overestimated, in my opinion. The structure of Putin's elite and Russian elite is totally different. Today's uh, Putin's elite uh, 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 g g uh, tries to get money in Russia and to spend them in the in the Western world, so they get money, the money, but their um, kids they study in uh, in London, in uh, Miami, in France. They have their money on, uh, on Swiss bank accounts in Switzerland, and they are linked directly to Putin. All these people. He, so of course he wants to. To, to, to reign like Stalin, but to live like uh, Roman Abramovich. But uh, of course, it doesn't make him less dangerous. But uh, uh, he wants uh, that in, in, in the Western world, we consider him as an Arab sheikh and to make business with him and doesn't uh, pay any attention to human rights and to respect of human rights. And this is the conflict between the Russian Federation, but Putin, sorry, and uh, the Western world. And of course, there is Russian civil society and what we, so we, in this dialogue, we are lawyers of Russian society. We, Russian opposition, we are the lawyers of Russian society. Because uh, uh, the fact that Putin uh, has a right not to respect the Constitution, of course it uh, uh, will bring a lot of problems to Russian society, to Russian civilization, and uh, it will stop our civil civilized development of our country. Uh, Raised by our Ukrainian colleague who came from Verkhovna Rada. Please introduce yourself and make your point. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Serhii Kiral, and uh, I'm a member of the Ukrainian parliament uh, representing Samopomich, uh, Samopomich political party, uh, just elected for the first term. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to really thank you, uh, Mr. Kassian and Mr. Yashin, for, for your reports. Uh, it's absolutely everything mentioned there, all the facts and all the evidence are true. Uh, this is something we know. Our uh, intelligence uh, knows our volunteers, uh, Ukrainian volunteers who are traveling back and forth to the east uh, on a daily basis, uh, providing support to the Ukrainian military and to uh, the uh, people that are fighting there for the Ukraine independence, because it's nothing else as a, as a war of independence uh, for Ukraine. Uh, we should not, of course, also forget about the, the prisoners of war that, uh, that are kept by Putin and Putin's regime in Russia right now, for people like uh, Nadia Savchenko and Mrs. Senso and, uh, and um, over 300 other Ukrainians now in, uh, in custody in prison uh, on the Russian territory, and uh, I call here also the European Parliament to do all uh, possible to, to free these people as soon as possible. Um, also, I would like to maybe have a quick comment on the, on the side of the reforms, uh, which Ukraine really need. I, I do share your uh, criticism here about this uh, slower pace uh, of uh, reforming Ukraine which is absolutely critical. Uh, we also believe within Samopomich uh, that a successful Ukraine, reformed Ukraine, is, uh, is a basis of the successful and the transformation in, in Russia, also a peace and security uh, in the region. Uh, 
And I think that the election of, of Samo Pomic to the, to the parliament is, uh, is an indication that, uh, that Ukraine is becoming a different country. You know, after Maidan, um, after this demonstration, the revolution of dignity, demonstration of the, of the people's will and determination that, that we will not put up with the regime, uh, the Yanukovych regime, um, this is, uh, I think, uh, what led to such political groups of the new generation politicians uh, becoming members of parliament. It is rather small. Uh, but on the other hand, we also have to realize in the context uh, that, that we are working in, because we still have over 60 or 70 percent of the MPs uh, representing the old uh, system, you know, the, the, the corrupt system that, that we need to fight. And, and this is the dilemma, because on one side you need unity, uh, the political unity, the unity of the coalition uh, to support the government and because you can't afford uh, another turbulence of uh, re-election and bringing more new people, new generation, younger people, reform-oriented people to the government uh, because of the, the war we are having with Putin. So uh, maybe you have some advice here. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, possible because in this case you probably need to know what actually Putin is going to do. Uh, or there are also f speculations that maybe it, it's the way to go is to freeze this conflict, uh, uh, have something like Germany had in the Western, Eastern Germany, or Korea, North, uh, South, and use this time un until the Putin regime will be dismantled, you know, three, I don't know, four, five years to, to do the reforms in a more or less stable environment, you know, attract the investments and fight corruption and things like that. Uh, so these are the ideas uh, which are uh, currently discussed, but one thing I'm sure about is uh, until we are in the parliament as a summer pomish, as the new uh, um, group, a new um, political cultural group in the parliament, we will not uh, rest uh, until uh, we really succeed. Thank you. Thank you. No Thank you. I would like to ask Mr. Kosyanov. You uh, said, and it was it's uh, really so, uh, that uh, all uh, events in Ukraine has co is connected with situation inside Russia, and it's really truth. Maybe can you say some words about situation of opposition in Russia. Uh, may, uh, maybe this opposition can be stronger, can be not so divided to different different uh, parts. And uh, what's the uh, main reason why we till this moment have no so strong uh, opposition uh, as it possible have? Uh. First, you should to, to admit that uh, we living in a, in a authoritarian regime. It is not possible in the perception of this regime, not possible to have a strong opposition. And therefore, they're doing their best to prevent that. What they do? They pressing our activists in the regions in particular, for instance, FSB officers coming to, to the activists and saying, what for you joined this group uh, these so liberals, they they selling our motherland to Americans. Uh, just what you 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 can lose just your job or your son could lose the seat in the university, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that is the permanent permanent flaw of dealing with 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 our activists in the, in the regions. That's one issue. Other issue just that we have we have support. I mean just. Um, uh, Liberals, Democrats, we have support like 10% and mostly it's limited in the big cities where people have access to internet and where people use internet as a source of information when people can compare different views and could make their own conclusion uh, judging and evaluating one or another event taking place in Russia or outside. As I said, majority of Russians or just at least half of population continue to, to use central television and some of them or many of them continue to believe if everything said on television that's truth 
just that propaganda is very sophisticated, up to date, and with the whole new technologies. It's not comparable with the Soviet Union, but it was stupid just way of explaining. And today's uh, uh, Kremlin's, Kremlin's propaganda is very sophisticated and, and uh, w widely spread in Russia and outside. And uh, we, despite all of that facts, we continue to fight and we continue to have unity. Just recently we made, uh, as we started with Boris Nemtsov last autumn, just to call Democrats to be united, and recently we made our principal decision, we uh, formed a, a, a coalition, democratic coalition, just many, just um, uh, five, in fact, in fact, political groups joined us, just pardoned us, on the basis of our party Parnas, another another important group uh, led by Alexei Navalny, maybe you've heard this name, also joined us, and we initiated this unity, and some other smaller groups just also joined us. We have a goal, I would say medium-term plan, just for, for, for this upcoming, uh, for coming two years. Next year we have parliamentary elections scheduled by constitution. Of course, as I said, just we don't have elections now. We have imitation. But we press authorities so that they will allow us to participate in those elections. In this case, our participation will bring some features of, uh, of uh, real feeling of elections. And in fact, people's, uh, I would say, attitude to what is going inside country is being changed right now. And in fact, they, after the deaths the murder of Boris Nemtsov started to reconsidering what happened yesterday, what taking place now, and what could happen tomorrow. And in fact, right now, just I wouldn't say just Russian society already waked up, but the, some features of that are already evident. And we hope that even this upcoming September, we will participate in four, three, four regions in the uh, regional elections, that Parnas or our coalition on the basis of Parnas would uh, would win some seats in the uh, regional parliaments, which we will show to the to the population that even in such an environment, that everything under concrete, under under beton, is everything. Even in such a situation, and people just don't believe that everything could be changed. Anything could be changed. We would like to demonstrate, and I hope we will, that even in such an environment, we can achieve something, because just the last year, the uh, uh, federal election that will be, I, I would say maybe the last chance for us to have a constitutional change of the situation in Russia. Other, if, if Putin doesn't start building up the exit strategy, I would put it this way, it means just, just boiling inside, inside uh, uh, Russia would, uh, would continue, can, would, would continue to, 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 to grow. And uh, we, at the moment, today, and uh, our, our, our policy of the party is to prevent revolutionary developments. And that's why we'd like the society to stand up now and press authorities now to participate in elections next year as a real opposition. And then we'll see what, what changes we can bring. Thank you very much. Uh, I see the last uh, question. Uh, please uh, be short and, uh, and another one. Jose and Anna. And Mark. <laughs> Can we take all, all together? Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Simon Papuashvili. I work for Brussels Space Advocacy Group International Partnership for Human Rights. We have uh, an office in Ukraine uh, through which we mainly focus on documenting crimes of international character, which we have been doing for the last year or so. And through our work, we have documented a number of serious crimes, including torture, uh, pur purposeful targeting of uh, civilian population resulting into casualties, enforced disappearances, etc., etc. Uh, another problem, in addition to the problem which has been described in this event, which is denial of truth, is lack of impunity or, uh, or lack of accountability, sorry, or total impunity. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not much has been done, including from the Ukrainian side, to kind of identify and punish the perpetrators. Uh, my question is to the representatives of the European Parliament. Uh, what are you doing in terms of encouraging your, your counterparts in Ukraine to, 
for example, ratified the Rome Statute and invite the International Criminal Court to look at those allegations. Thank you. Thank you. Anna? Uh, Anna was you. enlisted on the Putin's blacklist, by the way. Uh, yes, I have the, the honor to join some of the colleagues here and uh, being blacklisted. Hi. Uh, my name is Anna Maria Corazza Bild. I am uh, extremely happy to thank you as well for paying tribute to Boris Namso here. He was a good friend. He was coming to Sweden always to the seminar in, Bis in Visby. And, um, and really, we have, together with Guy and you, tried to at least raise our voice to have an impartial international investigation on, on him, as we did for continuous campaigning for Nadia Savashenko. Uh, first, may I say to our friend here that we have actually initiated in the delegation of Ukraine, the Joint Commission for Ukraine, it's in our resolution for three months ago, a commission of inquiry from this parliament on the crimes uh, committed in Donbass and Luhansk and the areas in conflict. And tomorrow, finally, after pressing and pushing, we have the first meeting in the subcommittee of human rights of AFET. It's not enough. Uh, we want more. I know Petras is working on that, and some of us are really pushing to uh, you. We hope that you will be able to join us. Whoever has eyes and ears, the message is really there shouldn't be any impunity. But because we have very little time, I would like to, uh, to ask a, a question to our courageous friends here. Um, what do you expect from the European summit the 25th of June? Because we're all aware of the propaganda war, the hybrid war, uh, the financial war that Kremlin and Putin is waging to divide us, to split us, to destabilize Europe, and to destabilize Ukraine. And there we have an opportunity. If you listen to the debate in this house in plenary next last week, where, where thanks God we had a large majority on the resolution, there's a lot of people who mix up a dialogue and cooperation with Russia, which we all want to have, and the threats from Putinism. Thank you. Joanna, Jose, and then Mark. <clears throat> Thanks, Petra. Well, I want to thank also your presence. I'm uh, an ALDI member uh, from Portugal, <clears throat> from the Earth Party. And um, we have a lot of uh, uh, country uh, people from your, from your country in, uh, in Portugal as well as Ukrainians. And we have Ukrainians from uh, Russian origin and also from Ukrainian origin. And they are all, there's a big fuss over there, big confusion over there. But uh, the general idea uh, is that uh, <clears throat> all of them are, almost all of them are very much against Putin, even the Russians. Uh, the thing is that um, um, what I wanted to ask you is, um, uh, shouldn't the, uh, the uh, uh, opposition, the democratic opposition uh, of Russia, have some sort of uh, contact, broader contact with these communities scattered all around the world. Uh, and there's a lot of, of Russians outside, outside Russia. And um, shouldn't there be some sort of, uh, say, a BBC program, uh, opposition, you know, that, uh, a program that used to, to, to happen in, in some years ago? And shouldn't there be uh, this way of linking with them and explaining them what's going on? Because most of them, do not know exactly what's happening there because they only receive uh, the news from the countries they are in, but, and the news they get from Russia is uh, obviously, it's a, uh, a directed uh, message. Shouldn't there be something like this, a program that perhaps the opposition could uh, create through the BBC or wherever? And, um, and also, uh, oh, and like for instance today, uh, I'm also in another, uh, meeting with the Venezuelans, which uh, it's very much uh, the same uh, problem. And they are uh, uh, coming uh, to their communities all around the, 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 the world and expressing their, their position. They are trying to also create a sort of a program like this. Uh, do you, could you expand on this, please? Thank you, Jose. Mark? Yes, thank you. Mark de Messemaker. I'm a Belgian uh, MEP. I also have the honor to be on Mr. Putin's list. Um, I hope and I praise you for uh, writing these reports because, uh, and I hope that uh, we can also inform better our own public opinion and that our own media will cooperate uh, spreading this, uh, this information and spreading the truth better also for our authorities, for our uh, public opinion. Uh, 
because also in this parliament there is sometimes a resonation, you know, of Mr. Putin's uh, propaganda. I myself have been intimidated the last uh, few days uh, myself uh, uh, by emails, uh, and if you look at the wording, it, it shows some grimness and it shows the impact of this kind of propaganda and ideology on the minds uh, of people, and this is this is uh, frightening. So I hope it will um, really help to bring out the truth more. And when you bring out the truth, you can start building better bridges between societies, the Russian and the European, the Russian and Ukrainian uh, societies again. I have a question concerning Minsk II and the future of the chances for success uh, of Minsk II. I mean, the involvement of the Russian Federation in Donbass is very clear, it's very uh, well documented. What is not so clear for me is what is the exact relation, the nature of uh, the relation uh, with the so-called, between the Kremlin and the so-called um, authorities in the uh, People's uh, Republics of Luhansk and Donetsk. What impact does the Kremlin have, has, have on these leaders, on their actions, or are they acting there kind of independently? Um, yes, that's, uh, that was all. Thank you so much. When I ask uh, everybody on this panel, uh, uh, representing our guests, I mean, to make short comments uh, concerning uh, the questions presented to you. Okay. If you could. If I can just, uh, I'll, I'll take two first questions on the ICC and, and, and a summit, and Ilya maybe just on, on the Russian abroad, and, and in particular, just Donbass sphere. On the ICC, yeah, I, I agree that that's absolutely the case, and the European Parliament will continue to work on with the Ukrainian authorities just uh, trying to ensure them the necessity of, um, of uh, uh, ratification of the status of ICC. Uh, it was signed in, in, in my time, it was almost simultaneously Russia signed ICC status and also Ukraine. None Russia, neither Ukraine ratified it. But today it is absolutely clear that we all uh, need just a proper investigation of uh, crimes, uh, war crimes and, uh, and crimes um, against humanity. Uh, and I think that that is, that is absolutely clear for me. On the summit, I think uh, we have a very clear picture, and my recommendation will be, as always, just be principled. It means just stay on your values, all values you all devoted to, and uh, Russia, Russian Federation by constitution too, just human rights priority, and of course the, the, the prevention uh, of uh, uh, architecture, security architecture in Europe. It means, it means not to try to find a compromise with Mr. Putin, just selling some kind of piece of sovereignty or, or territorial integrity of Ukraine. We cannot go this way at all. We cannot just have a compromise on this basis. It would mean banishment of Ukrainian people. What for we should banish Ukrainian people? by taking part of their sovereignty over territorial integrity. For their desire to be free and determine their future by themselves, I think that's absolutely immoral just to have a compromise there. There is no compromise with Putin on in this war. It means just stay strongly with your principled position and keep European unity and keep transatlantic unity on that. And uh, that's already some kind just, uh, I would say, the, the, the last way for this regime with this, with this um, uh, problem, Ukraine and, and Crimea in particular. It means, of course, I think all expected that the sanctions will be, will be prolonged for another period of time, and of course just express readiness to impose further sanctions if escalation would continue. I think that will be absolutely clear. I don't want my country to be under sanctions. Existing sanctions, I don't consider them as the sanctions against the country because just that sanctions against individuals and sectoral sanctions against just instruments which are in Mr. Putin's hands. That's state corporations which allow Mr. Putin to have flow of money and to keep this war in Ukraine. That is sanctions not against the country, sanctions not against Russian people. That's why I think just that it's important uh, to, 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 to have this position strong. And uh, of course, dialogue. It's not, I would say, dialogue, but contacts should be kept on a, on a high level. 
by Mrs. Merkel, for instance, by President Obama, by, by other leaders, uh, President Hollande, and other leaders of European Union, of <coughs> course, should ke keep just uh, context to understand what's going on, what's going on in Kremlin. And sooner or later, the Kremlin, Mr. Putin, would like to find a way out. Once you already offered to him the way out, inviting him for, for Normandy, so-called, just for the discussion, and the shaking hands, was treated by Mr. Putin as weakness. <clears throat> and in return, you got escalation. It means just you should understand the whole, the whole tactics of that. That's, Mr. Putin would like to be seen as a mad person. So they're expecting you to come to him with some kind of compromise. But he's not mad. He's continuing, uh, he's bluffing. And this is a very sensitive game. <clears throat> Just the, the, to win this game, just standing on values and principles. That's the only way. Thank you so much, Mikhail. Ilya? Well, I'll add a couple of words on independence of so-called Donetsk and Lugansk people, uh, people's republics. In our report, uh, we have created a chapter, Who Rules Donbass? And this chapter gives extensive reply to the questions you may have on uh, so-called independence of those republics. We managed to collect enough proof that uh, every political, military and uh, economic decision on those uh, uh, separatist uh, territories uh, are taken in Kremlin. In fact, those republics are managed from Moscow and separatists themselves, those, their leaders, have just a consultative right. I won't give any further details, but uh, during all Minsk negotiations, in Minsk I and Minsk II, separatists were uh, represented by the Russian president, and they waited outdoors, and they were informed about the decisions taken uh, later. It was Putin who uh, participated in the negotiations in the name of those separatists. Russian uh, military personnel, Russian generals, Russian officers, Russian businessmen are present on those separatist territories. They organized uh, this political and economical process to divide uh, Donbass from Ukraine. I may call it external government. To my right, uh, asking uh, these two experts, I mean, to make some uh, overview. Uh, so on, on Uh, regarding June 25th, um, you know, we, well, our argument would be that we cannot compromise at the expense of the vet. That we, on June 25th, we cannot compromise on. Um, we, we need to compromise where we need to compromise in a dialogue with uh, the Kremlin, but we cannot compromise uh, at the expense of the very values that brought Europe together um, following the end of the Cold War. That the very values that brought peace to the continent. Uh, so on June 25th, we think that we need to continue to have a very clear message uh, going outward, a united message that includes, of course, also maintaining the sanctions and uh, doubling down on them where it is needed and also doing so even more importantly as we move into the fall in October and November. Um, and also making sure that we do not abet to the Kremlin's message, but also that um, we have our own language, a language that's united. Uh, and briefly, I think someone was uh, pointing to uh, creating uh, uh, media channels in Russia earlier. I think it's very critical that the European Union has its own media channel that actually speaks directly to the Russian public uh, so that there is a clear message from us and that one that is not blurred by um, Russian outlets such as RT or Sputnik. Uh, and also then secondly to that, uh, it's very crucial that uh, we empower the Russian citizens themselves to educate themselves about what is going on on the ground, both domestically and also internationally, so they, that they can have more critical thinking about 
uh, the message that's being told to them and uh, trickled down to them from Moscow. And in part, the work that Elliot is doing, that we are doing, uh, the mythologies that we put into this report uh, might be one way of, of empowering actually the Russian public to go out and, and fact check uh, the news that is broadcasted to them in the you know Russian nightly use and start having their own opinions here at, um, and no longer be forced to follow the narrative that is put on them. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that as well, that these um, techniques and methodologies, they aren't complex, they aren't hard to teach. Um, you know, we can easily go out to organizations and teach them how to do this. Already, um, a lot of major human rights NGOs, activists and news organizations are already learning these techniques. So um, really, with even just a bit of support, we can easily spread this to people who themselves can start teaching this to people in countries, not just Ukraine and Russia, but to a whole range of countries in different situations. Thank you so much. And I invite for concluding remarks my colleague uh, Hans von Balen. Hans. Uh, thank you, Petras. First of all, we should conclude that we in the West, I don't speak about the Baltic States or Poland, but we in the West were blind as hell. We didn't see or we didn't want to see what happened in Georgia during the Olympic Games. We didn't want to see what happened to Moldova and Transnistria. And we didn't really want to see what happened in Ukraine. And there was one terrible eye-opener, a wake-up call, MH17. I come from the Netherlands. Around 200 people had a Dutch passport. About 100 people had other passports. And only at that moment, politicians around Europe said, hey, something is happening there. It will take probably a few months, but then we have two independent investigations, one of the prosecutor general in the Netherlands, one of the safety board. These instances cannot be manipulated. So I'm very much eager to know what they will tell. I don't know, but I have a feeling that their findings will be of utmost importance. So we should close also the idea of Francis Fukuyama, the end of history. There is no end of history. It is not a nice period and we only have economic competition and that we love each other and that military power has no role to play. Uh, so we should do one thing, to say to Mr. Putin, you have to return to international law. That is first and foremost to respect the independence of the countries like Ukraine, like Moldova, Georgia, and the other countries. There is no near abroad. It's unacceptable. That principle does not exist. And we have to have facts, many facts. These reports are factual, and we have many other facts. And we should not go to appeasement, because I see today that a lot of governments say, well, this conflict has taken too much time. It's, it's bad for our economy. Yes, it's bad for our economy. Yes. It's easy for me to say, but there are people in agriculture, in industry, who lose money. Yes. But it's much worse if Putin gets his way, because then it means that a big country, a great nation, because the Russians are a great nation, but they are ruled not by a great leader, that that country, being part of the Security Council, that country can do what it wants, land grab, repression, and this is a quite nice example for other countries, and we know all of them who have oppressional regimes. So it's in our best interest to say no to Putin and to accept that the sanctions have to stay. Only when the situation on the ground is different, if it's worse, we have to have more sanctions. If Putin would be that wise to come with concrete steps for instance, that Ukraine may patrol its own borders and that we help Ukraine with that. That would be a very concrete step. Uh, only then we can look at the sanctions. There is no quick fix. That's what we in the West want, a very quick fix. We have been debating this for a year, so now over to business as usual. That's impossible. It will be a long time conflict with Putin until he and his regime collapse. 
like the Soviet regime has collapsed. That Cold War, because we're in a Cold War, let's recognize that. And in a Cold War, you can have relations with Russian people, with Russian politicians of goodwill. We can invite academics and students. Those things can and should be done. But we should be crystal clear to the regime and those who support the regime. There is no business as usual. And what we should do indeed is to support Ukraine. There was a discussion about Greece. I don't want to, I want to enter this discussion, but we should support Ukraine. With military support, yes. With weapons, yes. With a NATO that is vigilant on the borders, making a forward advance, having troops in the Baltic states and in Poland, so that they know there is a tripwire. We can't accept aggression from the East. Yes, we have to support Georgia. We have to support Moldova and other countries of goodwill. And we should not think that what happens in the Crimea cannot happen in Estonia to call a country. I mean, you don't need much money to find a few people who want to make disturbance and then to say we have to help fellow countrymen. So there is indeed only one way based on facts that is to make it extremely difficult for Mr. Putin, who is not a great leader, uh, and to give Russia a position of a great nation which it should have, which respects international borders, which works together with colleagues uh, in other countries, and which is a real strategic partner. And for that, we have to be strong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. Indeed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it brings us I mean, to the very end of this panel discussion. I do wish to thank uh, all of you taking part in this uh, discussion, since we've been really enriched a lot by truth, not lies, as Mr. Putin, uh, Putin and his propaganda channels uh, and uh, smart uh, people are trying I mean, to do. But indeed, uh, at this very point, I wish to thank those people on my left very much for their determination and bravery to talk truth and be back to Moscow. Believe me, it's not easy. It's not easy, and we have some bad cases uh, in the past. Uh, I wish, I mean, they never are repeated in, in future. But anyway, I mean, those people deserve our applause, as well as on the right, those who made uh, those investigations and spent a lot of time, I mean, making very precise measurements in order to prove there are Russians, Russian troops on the Ukrainian soil, and they, uh, they fight against the Ukrainian nation and the Ukrainian state. So thank you indeed, and thank you all who made this happening possible, as well as our interpreters, uh, who probably had a hell business in order to uh, translate uh, our uh, quick language into, into the right one. So thank you indeed, and this is not a, a, the last event of this kind, and we will follow Mr. Putin uh, whatever it takes. Thank you. Thank you.